So we are in a series, and the series is the days of Noah. The days of Noah. And Jesus said that when he was going to return, let me, let me just let you know what it's going to be like, guys. It's going to be like in the days of Noah. That's what it's going to be like. So to the average Jewish student of the Torah or the Bible back then, they knew all the stories that we consider the Old Testament, but was their Bible or their Torah. It was Abraham, Noah, it was um, Joshua, it was Moses, it was King David, it was the prophets, it was Elijah. They knew all these stories because they were taught these things from their youth. And Jesus used those stories in a lot of his teaching when he spoke to the disciples. Also, when he rebuked the Pharisees and the religious leaders, he also used the stories of the Old Testament, how you don't even line up what they taught. So Jesus believed what we know as the Old Testament because he validated it, because he was a part of it, because he was God before he came to the earth and took on a man's persona. And the disciples saw his resurrection after his crucifixion. And they knew he was real because they saw him raised from the dead, and there were hundreds that saw him as well. And the disciples also saw him ascend into heaven, into the clouds, where he's going to return one day once again. They saw all that, so they knew Jesus was real. And most of them died not recanting what they knew. I cannot... Nobody would die for a lie, but they died for the truth. So as Jesus validated the Old Testament and the disciples validated Jesus, that's how we know he's real. And that's how we know the Bible is real because nobody would die for a lie. So that's what I love about the Bible. How do we know the Bible's true? I just told you why it's true. I just told you why it's true. The days of Noah. Uh, last week was our introduction, and Brian told me, <laughs> Brian told me we had quadruple the views of that video. Like, at least quadruple, right, Brian? Quadruple. Over all the other videos we've done, he's saying, I'm trying to figure out why we had so many. I said, Brian, it's probably the subject matter. It's probably the subject matter. So all I can say is it's, it's pretty cool, because this is what's weighing on a lot of people's hearts. The way the world is right now, even non-believers, this weighs on them because they are looking for answers and they're not getting any. Of course, they look to government and government can't get out of their own way. So my answer isn't in government. If I don't go to government, where am I going to go? You're going to go to the truth, which is Jesus Christ, the word of God and the church. That's the truth. And that's what God is kind of, he's kind, the walls are kind of closing in on the wall, on the world. And they have no place to go but the church. That's why our light needs to be really shining bright in the day that we live in, and we cannot back down from the truth. It's the truth that people know that sets them free. Not compromising the Bible and the Word of God and what the story is. That doesn't set anybody free. It keeps people in their bondage. That's why the church right now has to become more bold, more loving, but more bold in the days we stand in. Because as they try to cancel us, we say, you can try to cancel us all at once. You can't cancel God. You can't. They tried to do that when they cru crucified Jesus on the cross. They go, we're going to just cancel Jesus. We're just going to get rid of this problem. We're just going to cancel him. You think cancel culture started today? No, that's been going on for a long time. But they couldn't cancel him. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the throne of heaven. And he's returning again to show everyone who he is. But for now, we know who he is. And I praise God for we're on the right side of history. Thank you, Lord. But that was the introduction last week about how the things of Noah, uh, really the signs, I, gave, I think I gave seven signs of how we know these are the days of Noah. But today is part one, and we're going to be reading out of Genesis. Last week was Genesis chapter 6. Today is Genesis chapter 7. If you would, look up on the screen, or you can look on your handouts. We're going to read our text right out of the box. This is Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, and it's abridged because not all 23 verses are in here. But I put just enough just so we can understand what's going on here. It says this, 
Then the Lord, uh, excuse me, the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pair of every kind of clean animal, male and its mate, and, er and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons and his son's wife, excuse me, entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Verse 13. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. This is the key. Then the Lord shut him in. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds wiped from the earth, were wiped from the earth, excuse me. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Now, this is a biblical doctrine within Christianity that is rarely talked about in the church. You'll see it in fundamentalist churches where they're trying to bash you every week with condemnation and sin and get out of sin and, you know, God's going to get you. There are churches that preach that way, and they're totally out of balance. And they're not preaching the true gospel. But there is a doctrine in the church that's really talked about in uh, these days, and it's the doctrine of the wrath of God. The doctrine of the wrath of God. It is a biblical doctrine that is true. And it's throughout the Bible, the wrath of God. We hear about the love of God, the peace of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, all those things about God, but we never hear about the wrath of God. Because when you look at those things from a human level, they don't fit together. When you talk about all those loving attributes of God and you talk about his wrath, they don't fit together. So churches and pastors, particularly the progressive church, will just throw that right out the window and they never even cover it, the wrath of God. But it is a biblical doctrine. And as peace is a truth that we widely love, many times in the church, wrath is a truth that we widely loathe. Many in the history of the church have been embarrassed by God's wrath and its teachings and have wanted to revise it, to revise this biblical truth or erase it altogether. And um, yes, this theme of the wrath of God or the anger of God towards sinners, towards Satan, is clearly and widely taught in the Bible. The wrath of God was poured out on a wicked humanity in the days of Noah when in all their thoughts were continually on evil, there was nothing good happening, and they were wicked, they were violent, and they were violent towards one another. And if God had not intervened in this situation, no, not only was he grieved with the state of the world and his creation, he saw what happened and why it was happening, which I'll get into next week. However, if he had not stepped in to do this, they would have destroyed themselves. 
They truly would have. And now, where with the, his creation, the, 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 the crown jewel of his creation, human beings, where would they be? So he stepped in to replenish it, as we know. But Jesus said, in the end of the age that we're living in, the, the, the age we're living in right now, there was the, we're in the last days. The last days began at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in Acts chapter 2, and the church was born. That began the last days. And then right now, right before the rapture of the church, that is the envelope of time we're in. But we are also in what the Bible calls the latter days. That is the end of the end. I really believe that we are heading that way very quickly. But know this. These days of Noah that he spoke about in Matthew 24, Jesus, was a time in history when God once again poured out his wrath upon the world that had grown exceedingly wicked. And heading towards demonic-infused era that we're in, we're heading that way as right now. And even though many times we get sad, we get disheartened at the way the world is, but also the way America is. Because many of us who are north of 45, 50 years old, we remember a different time in America. We do. America was never perfect, never has been perfect. However, it was the hope, hope of the world. That's why many people wanted to immigrate here because it had more opportunities, but it also had more freedoms. But those of us who are 45, 50, north of 50, we remember a different America. And what we're doing actually without realizing it, we are all mourning what we have lost. We're mourning. You don't realize the sadness you feel, you're mourning. You're mourning what you have lost, what once was, which was never perfect, but it was pretty good. So this is what we see right now. So as, even as Americans, as we look at our country, and as the world, you look at the state of the world, it's not what it once was. It seems to be spiraling out of control. But in our disheartened state, as we look at that, as a church, I want you to be encouraged. Because Jesus predicted this. The Old Testament prophets predicted this, that this was going to happen as the end of the age of this era began to happen. So we can do nothing to stop it, nothing to prevent it. We just have to be prepared. As I said, the flood was coming. Noah couldn't stop it. He couldn't extend it. He couldn't say, can we just kind of maybe extend this out a little bit? No, no, no. It was coming. All as Noah could do was prepare himself and put his faith in God that he was going to be okay. If he obeyed God and walked with God and didn't stray from God, he was going to be fine. And we knew the story that, yes, he, is, he was okay. This is how we are as the church. Even though the world can be very unsettled right now, Jesus predicted we were going to be going through a thing called birth pains. Wars, rumors of wars, worldwide pestilence. We're going to see uh, many times the, the earth experience all types of, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes. And even the oceans are going to have tsunamis. That's all in Matthew 20, 24. And it seems like, look at all the flooding. You notice all the flooding in 2024? I mean, so many places, it's just not just Lemonster. I mean, all over the place. We've got this nonstop flooding all over the place. You see waters that are, they're going to blame it on global warming. And I don't even want to get into that debate. But God said this was going to happen. This was going to happen. You're going to see signs in the skies, the moon, the sun, the stars, which is things in the universe are going to begin to speak to us. So all kinds of things we're going to start seeing happening in this time and space that we're living in. So pay attention of everything. But it's going to happen. So what happened is God poured out his wrath on the earth. What he did is he had to really deal with this thing. Now remember, the problem was with these people with God. We have to remember that. The problem was between God and them and them and God. They had no need for God, did not want God. They wanted to live the way they wanted to live, which was wicked, evil, and violent. And God said, if I'm going to, because they have rejected me so much, I know what the end of the result's going to be of this thing. I'm stepping in. I'm going to wipe them out. We're going to start all over again. 
Now what happens is, when that happened, I want to just give you, before we get to our points on the back of the back of your handouts, I just want to say something about God's wrath. Now, I want us to understand some things about the doctrine of God's wrath that, so we're not confused about his love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his patience, and his kindness. That is who God is. And we, we're so grateful for that. But we have to understand why his wrath is what it is. First of, firstly, the anger of God or the wrath of God is not like our anger or our wrath. You know, when we speak about the wrath of God, remember that it's the wrath of God, not the wrath of man. So everything we know about God, he is kind, he is just, he is loving, he is good. But he needs to pour into our understanding his wrath because he is holy, he is right, he is just, he is perfect, and he can't, and he's long suffering. That flood was a hundred years away. He gave that generation time to repent and nobody took him up on his invitation because Noah kept telling him, telling them, it says in 2 Peter chapter two, he kept telling them, he's a preacher of righteousness. You better repent, there's room on the boat. You may have to sit next to a donkey or a monkey, you may stink, but it beats the alternative. No, nope. they just said, no, nope, no thanks. But you're gonna live the way we wanna live. That's the way people are today. When you give them the message of Jesus, it's the same thing. But his wrath has to be poured out on the response for the unholiness of mankind, the wickedness of mankind, the, the, the rejecting of God's offer of salvation to bring them into a reconciliation with them, with them. They reject all of that. That's the culture we live in. They cry out to be satisfied, to live the way they want. I wanna live every way I want and don't put any restrictions in front of me. My sin cries out to be fulfilled. Leave me alone. And by the way, execute those people called Christians because they're the ones getting in our way. That's in their heart. Jesus said, they put me on the cross because they hated me. And never remember, Jesus said, remember, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. So don't be surprised when the world hates you. If the world speaks kindly of you and sings your praises and says everything's good with you and they can do business with you, then maybe you're doing Christianity wrong because there needs to be some type of offense about our life to Christ. Not from a place of arrogance, not from a place of trying to be, be a troublemaker, but the fragrance that we have with our Christian lives should bring a beautiful smell in the nostrils of God and it should be a stench in the nostrils of the world. That's how true Christianity is. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Yes, okay? So, but you're not doing it to be offensive. You're naturally offensive if you live the Christian life the way it's supposed to be lived. So God has to pour his wrath out, but it's not like our wrath. It is to bring judges, judgment and justice for his account. Secondly, God's wrath is provoked. He just doesn't sit around getting angry, thinking about how he can, you know, get back at people who hate him. He doesn't do that. He sent his own son to be executed for the world's behalf, that anybody could be saved and forgiven because of the execution of his son. That's how much he loved the world in John chapter three. So he doesn't sit around thinking about how he's gonna destroy the world. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. That's who God is. However, sinful mankind, after a while, begins to provoke God, po poke their finger right in his eye. And we see that happening in the societies around the world. We see that happening with arrogant leaders around the world who think they are God and that they will control this world. There's a, tw there's a, there's a, there's a 2030 plan to control the world. I'm gonna talk about that next week. I don't think it's ever going to come to fruition. I don't think God's going to allow it to happen. But boy, they're going to make us miserable trying to enact it. So I'll talk more about that. That's on the drawing board right now, the 2030 plan to globalize the world. But anyways, it's provoked. And when God enacts wrath, it's provoked. It's not because he wants to do it. It's because of who he is, he has to do it. And also God is slow to anger. As I said, it took 100 years for the ark 
to lift up out of the water and for that flood to come. God gave people a chance. Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years. God has given people a chance. And the gospel is being spread throughout the world, and people are hearing it, and people are rejecting it, and people are receiving it every single day. In America, and in Western civilization, nobody has an excuse. The gospel has been with us for so long. It's whether you receive Jesus or reject Jesus. So, but he's slow to anger, giving people the chance to repent and come to him because that's who he is, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness. But God's wrath is stored up. I mean, we always cry out, God, when are you going to deal with this? When are you going to judge this? When are you going to deal with this leader? When are you going to... We always do that in our humanness. But his wrath is stored up. He's patient. He's long-suffering. But in the time, what's going to happen is he is going to be on the day of wrath when Jesus returns again. Everyone is going to be brought up into his holy courtroom. And he is going to be the ultimate judge to judge every single man and woman who ever lived in this earth in the great white throne judgment. I don't know how that's going to happen, but the book of Revelation said that's what he's going to do. Because he is righteous and just, there'll be no appeal process, there'll be no appealing to a higher court. He is the highest court. And the judgment will be final. But for you who are in Christ, you will not be there. You will be at a different judgment, which is the judgment for your works, the judgment for the things you did. Every dollar you gave to fund his kingdom, every kind word you did, every prayer you prayed, every way you served in his church, everything you did with right motives for the Lord will be rewarded. It will be evaluated, judged, and rewarded because your sins are already gone. They're on the cross. That is amazing. That is amazing. And lastly, God's wrath is against sinners, sinful people who refuse to repent and come into his family. Those are the ones, it's not you. I mean, John said in, uh, uh, in the book of John 3.36, Jesus said this, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Hmm. It is already there. The wrath of God's already there. It has to be removed. It has to be taken away. And those who are in Christ, it's been taken away. So that's what I love. So what I'm going to do right now, real quickly, is we'll go through the four. Is it four? I think it's four. Yeah, four things that correlate you and me with Noah in those days. So when things get a little rough, things get a little uncertain, understand where your position is. You are already on the ark. You're on the ark. Remember, you're on the ark. So that's what I want to do. I want to look at the similarities between the both of us. Noah and the true church are saved from the wrath to come. I love that. You notice I'll, I'll tell you, I'll always say the true church. The true church. The true church is the one who is sold out to Jesus, who believes the Bible, tries to live it, understands it's the word of God, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other. That's the true church. So that's global. That's in the millions on the earth. But that's the true church. Number one, Genesis 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have, because I have found you righteous in this generation. You know, there's a lot of talk today about tolerance. We're always being told to be tolerant. Everybody wants to be, have tolerance towards them, but they're the most intolerant people towards us. That's the way it is. I understand that's the way the world works. But know this. God was very intolerant during this, during this season. He said, I'm going to wipe out the world. I'm sick of their sin. I'm sick of their violence. I'm sick of their rebellion towards me. I'm sick of everything they're doing. I'm going to wipe them out. Because if I don't wipe them out, they're going to wipe themselves out. And then Noah preached that message because we know from 2 Peter chapter 2 that he was a preacher of righteousness. And we know from Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith that it was through faith, by faith, God, Noah believed everything that God told him and it saved him and his family. His faith saved him. 
That's what Hebrews 11 says. What saves you? It's your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, he was righteous in his generation. And when he preached, Noah, what are you doing? Why are you building a big ship on dry land? I mean, are you nuts? We talked about that last week. They thought he was nuts. I would have thought he was nuts, I guess, if I was there. He said, God said he's going to flood the earth. And everything you see is going to be underwater. And he told me that if I want to be saved, build this ship. And when it happens, me and my family be saved. Think about how crazy that message sounds to a sinful and violent and wicked generation who has no heart for God. It sounds crazy, but in the end, he was right. And he preached it, and he preached it. And I'm sure he heard the scorn and the ridicule from everybody. But over a hundred years, he never stopped his faith in God. He believed everything God told him, even though he never saw a drop of water come out of the sky. It was faith because he believed what God told him and he acted on his faith. You and I as Christians have the word of God before us. We have the Holy Spirit in us and God speaks to us every single day. And initially when you came to Christ, you believed what God said. Even though you couldn't see heaven, even though you can't see the wrath to come at the second return of Christ, even though you can't see the great tribulation that will unfold on the earth with a one, one nation, I mean a one world government leader we know is the Antichrist, we can see that beginning to be put together, but we don't know when that's going to happen. Even though there's lots of things we don't see, we believe what God said. We believe what God said about us, about him, and what our need is for him. And if without Jesus, there is no ark. There is no salvation. There's no way out. You can go to swimming classes for the next six months. You will not be able to swim your way out of a flood. The ark was it. Jesus is it. And look what it says in Romans chapter 9, 5. Excuse me, Romans 5, verse 9. This is the LEB version. <coughs> Therefore, by much more, because we have been declared righteous, now by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath. Noah was saved from the wrath that was coming. You will be saved from the wrath that's coming on this earth because you are already on the ark, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, how have we been declared righteous? Because the blood of Jesus Christ is on your life. When God the Father looks at you and looks at me, he doesn't see sin. He sees righteousness because he looks at us through the blood of Christ. I don't know how he does that. He chooses to do that. But when we are in sin and we don't repent of it as a loving father, he will begin to deal with that for our own good and for his name. But know this, you have been declared righteous through the blood of Christ. You, God looks at you like he did at Noah's. It was faith that made Noah righteous. It was faith that saved Noah's. It is faith that has made you righteous and it's faith that will save you in the end if you don't back down. And no, no, I don't think anybody in this room is going to back down. That's a great correlation between Noah and us. I love that. I love that. Number two, Genesis 7, verse 7. Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons and wives entered the ark to escape the waters from the flood. To escape the waters from the flood. The waters had not come yet, but they were coming. But they were on the ark and they were safe. They had thoughts, they had all kinds of questions, they didn't know what to expect, but they knew they were in the best place possible, the safety of the ark. What about you? What about me? We know there's something coming. That's by faith in the Word of God. The Word of God tells us at the end of days, when the, when the final chapters of this story on earth are written, that it's not going to be good. There's a flood coming. It's called the tribulation period, and then the last half of it will be the great tribulation, where 
Two-thirds or three-quarters of the world will die on the earth under the reign of the Antichrist. The blood's going to be so deep, it's almost like up to your knees. That's, what the, that's the picture they give. Because Satan hates you. He hates the human race. And he's going to use this opportunity to be worshipped, the very thing he's been wanting his whole life, to be worshipped by the world, to stick it in God's eye. And because he's an ugly, evil, murdering liar, he's going to turn and he's going to use the Antichrist to begin to enact devastation on this earth. And people are going to flee all over the place. Then Israel is going to know they bought a lie. He isn't our Messiah. And many of them are going to come to Christ in droves. But it's going to be during the tribulation period. You and I are on the ark. We're going to be what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb after the rapture. We're going to be taken away. That's my next point. We're going to be taken away with Jesus at a great celebration. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride and the groom are together at a great celebration while this is all happening on the earth. Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by men which we must be saved. That's pretty narrow. Either you believe it or you don't. Now, many times when you and I are in crowds of people, it could be at a sporting event, it could be at a concert, it could be anywhere that you go, it could be anywhere, Massive crowds. When you as a Christian look around at these crowds, do you ever think to yourself, how many of these people are going to heaven? Do you ever think that way? I know the evangelist does. You got an evangelistic heart, you think that way. But it's like, that can't be true. These little seeds of doubt come in. That can't be true. God's going to, are these people going to miss heaven because they don't know the Lord? See, those are little whispers that the enemy puts in our ear. But know this, there is no other name under heaven among men which we must be saved. The moment you said yes to Jesus and accepted his message and accepted his offer of grace and mercy, you entered the ark. You entered the place of safety. Because in Noah's day, the only place of safety was that boat. You couldn't even climb up to the highest mountain because the highest mountain was 20 feet underwater. It says that in Genesis. There was no place. They all perished. And that's going to happen also in the days of the last days, my friends, in the days we're living in. If you're not on that ark, there is no other answer. But the world has all types of answers and alternatives, don't they? They do. There is no other answer. And believe me, sometimes we wrestle with that, saying, it's so narrow. It's so intolerant. It's so unloving. Listen, let's not try to put our love and our, our righteousness up against God's. It's like, I, know, I realize God can be hard sometimes, and, you know, I mean, he's, sometimes I, the wrath of God and stuff, I realize that. Don't, don't let that bother you, because he can be a little like that sometimes, but he really is loving and kind. It's almost like we try to apologize for God. We try to make ourselves more loving, more kind, more tolerant, because he's not that way. Think about the think about what we do sometimes as Christians. Now, we don't, we don't outshine that at all. My goodness, know this. You're on the ark, stay on the ark. Stay on the ark. Live on the ark, which is the safety of Jesus Christ. Number three, Genesis 7, 13. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. Then the Lord shut him in. When that door was shut, that ended the season of grace. When that door was shut, that ended the season of grace to repent, to come to a place of safety. And what happens is, when that happened, and the boat began to lift, the boat began to creak back and forth, and the boat began to rise. The animals were stirring, they didn't know what was going on. 
a little bit unsettling, very uncertain, because Noah had never done this before. He just obeyed what God told him to do. And then the next season began, which was the wrath of God being poured out on the earth with that flood. But Noah was safe, and so was his family. But what I'm getting at here is what Noah had to realize, what he had to listen to, he had to listen to the pounding on the boat. He had to listen to the screams, let us in. He had to listen to, Noah, you're finally right, I believe you. And he could do nothing about it. Because the Lord shut that door. And Noah now had to probably get to the place where saying, I wish they had listened to me. That day's coming, my friends, where all the preaching you have done, all the witnessing you have done, the way you've stood for Christ and lived authentically, and you've bore the scars for that, as Noah has done. There's going to be time where the end's going to come and the door's going to shut. And then this season of grace is going to be over. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. The Apostle Paul telling a nervous Thessalonian church that thought they missed the rapture. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their grave. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain in the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then will we be with the Lord forever. I love this part. So encourage each other with these words. If you're telling me I'm going through the wrath of God, then you can't encourage me. There's nothing you can say to encourage me. But when you can tell me that he's going to catch us away, this is just one scripture. There's other scriptures. What's going to happen is when the Lord comes, right before the reign of the Antichrist begins to unfold in this world, those who, have, those who have died in Christ now, that's the church in heaven. We are the church in, on the earth right now. They used to be the church in the earth, but now they're the church in heaven. We are now the church in the earth, but we're all one big family. What's going to happen is Jesus is going to come down. The Apostle Paul, by the way, thought the rapture was going to happen in his lifetime. He thought it was going to happen in his, his lifetime. They all did. They thought he was coming back right away, particularly when the Roman persecution started. They thought, oh, he's coming back now. But no, it's going to happen, I believe, possibly in our lifetime. But what's going to happen is those who have died, their soul and spirit, their, real, their ghost, if you will, the real you, the real you, your mind, your will, your personality, what makes you unique, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act, the way you reason, that's all part of your soul. And your spirit is the part that has been raised to new life with the Holy Spirit. That's in heaven right now. The body is either cremated or it's in the ground or it's all turned to powder, whatever. But they're in heaven right now. And what's going to happen when the Lord comes back, those bodies are going to be raised from the dead instantly. If they're, if they're powder, if they're ashes, they'll be, the molecules and everything else will be materialized. Don't tell me that God can't do that. He can and that soul and spirit is going to marry their brand new body in an instant. It's going to be a glorified body, the same body Jesus had when he resurrected from the dead. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he had enough of body. He wasn't the same. He could appear, he could disappear, he could be here, there, he could change appearance. Look at the road to Emmaus. He was walking with two, 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 of his, two people that loved him and followed him, but they didn't know it was him until he vanished. See, it's going to be a different body. It doesn't have to eat and drink to survive. But it can eat and drink just for pleasure if it wants to. <coughs> Those people who are in the grave, they're going to be resurrected instantly. And their soul and spirit will be reunited with their resurrected body. If you and I or anybody else is on the earth when that happens, we will be changed in an instant. Paul teaches that in other places in Thessalonians. We're going to be changed like this. And then all of us, that happened to them first, then it'll happen to us second, and then we will all be with the Lord and meet him in the air. 
encourage one another with those words. But he's going to leave us here to go through the great wrath that's coming on the earth. If he didn't do that for Noah, and he didn't do that for Lot, he's not going to do it for us. So we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Matthew chap- uh, Revelation chapter 19. We're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb to have a feast and a party with our Savior. And then at the end of the tribulation, seven years later, we're coming back with him when he begins to rule and reign on this earth in righteousness, power, and authority with an iron scepter. He's going to enforce his will on this earth in righteousness, purity, and we're going to be with him. That's what's going to happen. So understand this. When we are taken out of the way, that's when the age of grace stops. Now, the wrath of God is going to begin to come on this earth. With the great tribulation, people are going to believe the lie that the Antichrist is the truth, that is the answer, the false Messiah. Believe me, he will solve every war going on the earth. He will have people signing peace treaties. He will make Israel and the Arab world love each other because he's going to have all the answers to their problems because he is the problem. And when he begins to take the problem away, it's amazing how he's going to bring peace on the earth. Finally, this is the Messiah. That's what the world will say. That's what he wants, to stick it to Jesus. But it says, because they will believe the lie, the wrath of God's coming. The lie is that he is the real deal and Jesus is the fake. That's what the Antichrist is going to be. So, but we will be with him. Lastly, this is, this is the one that stuck out to me. This just stuck out to me so much. Number four, Genesis 7:23. Now, I'm going to read the whole 23. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creature that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him on the ark. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people that perished. Is that true? When you compare only Noah and his family were on the ark, and everybody else perished, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Do you know what this is? Noah and his family represent what I've been preaching to you for a long time now. They are the remnant. They were the small, small section of true believers who were rescued and saved. In this earth, there are millions and millions and millions and millions of Christians. Many of them think they're Christians, but they're not. I'm not going to judge them. He will. But right now, what he's doing, Muriel and I went to the uh, Topsville Fair um, last, I think last week. And uh, oh, at the weekend it closed. It was a couple, either last week or the week before, I can't remember. We saw such a picture of what Jesus is doing right now. You know, my little five-year-old granddaughter, she took me. She said, Grandpa, I want to go see the, I want to go see the animals. Uh, she doesn't like the smell, so she does this. I says, you don't like the way it smells in there? I know. I'm going to hold my nose. But, so she grabbed my hand. We walked in. And we look at, I picked her up, let her see the animals. She's five years old. But she didn't take her finger off that nose. She hates animal smell. But what we saw, it spoke to both of us. We saw a pen, you know, the different pens. They had goats, they had ponies, they had sheep, they had pigs. But there was a, there was a gated in area that had sheep in it, little lambs, sheep. And then over here, there was little goats, okay? And there was a barrier between them. And God spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke to both of us, said, isn't that what he's doing now? He is separating the sheep and the goats. The sheep could not go in that pen, and the goats couldn't go in that pen. On the earth right now, God is beginning to separate who's truly his and who isn't. And it's the pressure from this world to compromise is what's revealing what's in men and women's hearts. And they're either going to sell out Jesus and go to a progressive church that doesn't even believe the word, teach the word. They believe in some other crazy demonic philosophy. Even though there's candles and all kinds of pretty stained glass windows and the pastor, which I use in quotation marks, wears a, a nice clerical garb, it's happening all over the place. 
Some of these people better be careful because they're playing with the truth of God. And some of these, some churches basically have been sold out a long time ago, all over the world. You look at, you look at England, you look at France, you look at Europe, they are going so over the top progressive that the true gospel can't even be found over there. That's happening here as well. But there are many who are standing up and saying, uh-uh, I will not back down from what I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe his word's true, I believe I am his, and I am not going to recant. That's the remnant. That's who we are. We still equal in the millions of people on the earth. There's millions of us. But when you see what Christendom is, man, a lot of it, a lot of them are goats. A lot of them are goats. They are not really sheep. And Jesus knows who they are, and he's separating them right now. So when you see certain people fall away, certain people doing certain things, it disheartens you when they call themselves Christian. You see them on a talk show. You see, it's like, what, you believe that? It's because he's separating the sheep and the goats right now, and he's developing his true remnant for this end time that we're in right now. Those are the ones who are going to be called away. Noah represents the remnant on the earth at his time. And I'll leave you with this. Matthew 5, 13, through, uh, 13 and 14. You can enter God's kingdom. This is the words of Jesus now, not Pastor Paul. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few find it. I didn't say that. Yeah, I always throw it back on Jesus. I didn't say that. Do you choose to believe that for today? That's the problem in Christianity right now. Well, I, we don't want that. We don't want, you need to take the whole thing, even the, uh, the uncomfortable parts. The wrath of God is coming because it's provoked. It's been coming for a long time, but there's a season where you can still get on the ark but when we're taken away, my friends, the door's gonna be shut to the ark. Now it's time for judgment. Aren't you glad you're on the ark? That's the similarities that we have with Noah. Remember, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, hidden things. But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, opened up. Many of the things in the Old Testament that we see, those word pictures, are all spiritual uh, parallels to what we are in the church today. So I'm so glad, and now at the sound of my voice, if you are not on the ark, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your living and loving Savior, your future does not look good. Your, your tomorrow doesn't look good because there's so much uncertainty in your life. But in the midst of uncertainty in this world, if you are truly in Jesus Christ and embrace him and say, Lord, I repent of my old life, my sinful life. You are the answer. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Please wash my sins away by the blood of Jesus. I receive you by faith. Give me the Holy Spirit and help me to walk in power and truth for my remaining days on earth. That's what you need to do. Whether you're on video watching me right now or in this room, you have to get on the ark. There is no other way out. No other way out. Boy, is that intolerant. I didn't say it. He did. I just choose to believe it. And that puts me in a place not of arrogance, but of deep humility and awe. I say, Lord, my goodness, you know, I feel, I feel so privileged and humble that I belong to you. Where would I be without Jesus, both now and in eternity? We all have to always remember what he has done for us and what continues to, and to spread that message. Spread that message that Jesus is the hope of the world. Amen to that, okay? Congratulations to all of you on the ark. You're in a safe place. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we see the turbulence in this world, where world leaders don't seem to have any answers to the problem because many times they are the problem. But Lord, as we pray for our world, we pray for our leaders to have godly solutions to problems. We put our faith in you because our destinies are all already settled in you. 
Jesus, it's your blood and your grace and your mercy applied to our lives through our faith in that work that has placed us on the ark. And we thank you that as Noah was saved from the calamity and the judgment and the wrath of God, so will your true remnant church in these last days. Help us to be true. Help us to stand strong against persecution. Help us, Lord, to understand when we are persecuted or maligned or made fun of because we believe in you, that as others scorn at us, you stand and applaud of our loyalty to you. It brings joy to your heart. Let us never forget that, Lord. I pray a special strengthening upon your church right now, that we would be strengthened in the hour that we live in. We would be bolder, not with arrogance, but with confidence that we do have the right message. And that, Lord, there would be an anointing of the Holy Spirit on our words, our lips, and our lives that would make others really realize that they need something. They need their Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, thank you for our time here today. Thank you for what you taught us here today. And we give you all the praise and glory for all that we have. Jesus, it's you that we praise, you that we serve, and you that we stand for in the hour we live in. Let us bring glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.